coming to this talk, Rationale Classification for Educational Trading Platform. So a brief biography first. My name is Annie Yang. I'm currently a manager of Vancouver AI Lab for Cisco. Um, so in the past, my past role was a lead data scientist at Equity Sim, which was where this work was done. Um, some past highlights from my research career. I was eight years as a researcher at IBM TJ Watson Research Center in New York, and then I've gone to APM as paper awards in the past. And happened to my co author, Pablo. So, um, I also work at uh, TJ Watson, uh, was a part of the original uh, TJ Watson Job Party System. I now have a consulting company in Vancouver, and among the work I have done in financial and language processing, I have a patent pending on a way of doing transaction categorizations on uh, credit cards, the, um, the transactions that may be interest to people in the, this workshop. Awesome. Cool. And by the way, Ni Hao. What does Sam go to Shen Petana Chanda? Just a little brief hello to Chinese speaking people and hello to everyone. Great. So Equity Skin, which was a company I worked for, a startup, um, they were building a trading simulation platform. So the purpose of these platforms are for professors teaching a finance class to have an opportunity for students to practice trading. So as opposed to just learning the finance concepts in school, they wanted the students to be able to make a trade, but without actually you know, investing their own money. So this is an example view of um, equity sim, the trading platform, so you can place trades and stocks, options, futures, and then construct a portfolio. And then you see the market value of the time. So because this is an educational trading platform, the platform wanted to encourage students to think through the trade. So as opposed to just sort of placing trades randomly, they want to make students to think through why are you constructing the portfolio that way? Should you be diversifying the portfolio? What instrument should you buy? So there's a field when a student plays a trade called rationale, which um, a student is encouraged to justify the trade. So these are two examples of rationale from the actual system. Uh, so as a company is expected to show strong performance following Trump's increased defense spending. Um, and then a second one just says good stock. So a question for all of you. If you were a professor, which of these rationale would you say is better? The first one or the second one? If you have to give it a grade. Anyone? First one, right? Yes, exactly. So this is sort of why this work is motivated. So if we just count up how many rationale a student provides, that would count these two rationales the same, whereas the first one should really be given a better grade if you're a professor. So this is sort of the motivation of this work. Um, just a little bit of background first. Yeah, so Equity Sim, um, which was a company who built a trading simulation platform, was founded in 2017. Um, it was a startup at its height, uh, 15 people. Um, I currently uh, don't work there anymore. I'm given a really great opportunity at Cisco. I'm, I'm leading the Vancouver AI lab right now. Um, but the, the current company is trying to get rich funding at the moment. So um, again, going back to these rationales. So these rationales, uh, if you were a professor, you want to count these, the good ones for more weight, um, counting for class, class participation. So rather than just you know counting up how many rationale provided, we want to be able to grade which ones are better. 
So, by better, what do we mean? This is what I'm going to introduce, the first part of this talk, from that observational study. So through this observational study, we constructed a definition uh, for this task called thought for rationale, which I will define next. Um, in the second part of the talk, we will talk about approaches to automate this labeling of thought for rationales. Great. So observational study, what does that mean? So here we're trying to understand what it means by good rationale versus bad. To do that, we conducted a qualitative study, a think aloud qualitative study, where um, an expert, a finance expert, were presented um, uh, 11 student profiles. So these student profiles, we can see what trades they made, what were the portfolio, what was the return graph, and all the information, the rationale, and so on. So this finance expert walked through these 11 student profiles. And using the Think Aloud protocol, so the notes could be taken systematically and see kind of what factors contribute, what makes the students trade good versus bad. So these are um, on the right hand side, the factors we found. So the first one related to portfolio risk and return. So for example, the industry expert was, you know, go through a profile and could be saying, you know, look at the performance chart and say, oh, good looking chart, you know, the, the performance looks steady, good returns. So that, that really talks about, you know, portfolio risk and return. So that's an example. The second example, code, uh, the second factor, portfolio diversification. So it's an example of that, the industry expert you know, would go through a profile and could be saying, um, oh, the diversification here doesn't look good. 81% of the portfolio was invested in one company and then lots of other companies you know, in very small percentages. So that doesn't sound like a good diversification. So that's an example of what the industry expert said for, for that factor. And then the third one, rational text. So this is the focus of this talk. Um, so the industry expert will look through the rationale of the trades and you know, make comments about good versus bad trades. So I, this this is going to be the focus of the rest of the talk. So I will I will just jump to the last two quickly right now. So four we hear complex instruments. The industry expert would you know comment on how a student was using or not using complex instruments like options, futures. This instrument requires like additional knowledge uh, than you know, just personal stocks. And then the last one, trading strategy. One example that um, industry has said, talking about bounds that students put on the prices and you know, how they were waiting out um, uh, to, to sell and so on. Great. So with these factors in mind, um, we realized rationale was really important. So here I'm showing you some example of what, in terms of our definition, thoughtful versus not. So thoughtful is something like possible rate increase in next week or like projecting the market to fall after election. First, not thoughtful would be like good trade. Or company taking an exciting new direction. So you can sort of see thoughtful ones are more specific. They involves a specific type of research versus not thoughtful would be kind of just like a very general statement. So with that, we construct a definition um, we actually have four levels, um, which in later, um, when we constructed the labeling task, the classification task, we were grouping the first two as not thoughtful and the last two as thoughtful. But essentially, not thoughtful really means like little known thought 
or I'm a very simplistic or general statement versus thoughtful, um, contains specific type of research and or analysis. So this is basically the definition, you know, thoughtful documents, external research, specific, specific strategy, and so on. Great. So now that we have the definition of what is a thoughtful rationale, um, I would like to talk about data. Uh, we annotated manually about 2,000 rationales as, you know, those four levels. For the um, supervised learning class task, uh, these Rationales were from 35 randomly selected students in the trading platform from that protection data. Um, with the duplication, there were uh, about 800 rationales. Some additional data we used in experiments includes uh, some article from Thomson Reuters and also an additional uh, 13,000 rationale. They're unannotated for the later transfer learning task. So here's the distribution of the rationales that we annotated in terms of the levels. So most of them were actually not thoughtful. Very few of them were thoughtful actually. We conducted an agreement uh, check. So we have our actually second offer. <laughs> uh, just randomly, uh, you know, on a randomly selected sample of 25 rationales, just trying to see the inter-rater agreement. Um, we achieve a moderate in inter-rater agreement. So now moving on to, to the approach. Uh, we conducted a few experiments. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the baseline, a very simple baseline that basically just looks at the length of the rationale and whether the rationale contains a digit. So that uh, motivation about the digit is trying to capture, you know, some people would say like interest rates or like certain specific numbers. And then I'm also going to talk about uh, the best model for this task we found so far using a CNN model provided by the Spacey Library. And then Pablo is going to talk about the rest of the approaches. So the baseline, again, the baselines look at pretty much the length of the rationale. Um, so in one baseline, looking combining the two conditions we are, the other baseline combining the two conditions we had, looking at length of the character, length of the rationale, and whether the rationale contains a digit. The precision recall. For this baseline, actually, it's not too, too bad in, in a way for such a simple baseline. Um, when you do the N, the precision actually is super high, but we have a pretty low recall. So overall, the F measure is low. So in terms of the spacey model, it's a CNN model. In terms of architecture, it uses a hierarchical attention network. So from spacey, um, it does have the word level and the sense level attention there, but because rationales are short pieces of text, so really only the word level applies just because it's usually just one sentence. Um, and then in terms of embeddings, um, the CNN provided by Stacy uses the subword features as well as the Bloom embeddings. Um, this particular CNN also profits from pre-trained position-based vectors. So using this model from Stacy on that set of tr um, training data I talked about earlier, 
to achieve a precision recall of around all around uh, 80 80%. And this is the best system out of out of all the systems we tried. So now I'm going to pass along to Pablo. Hello. Okay, so when uh, uh, Dr. Lin approached me to uh, look into this uh, data, the thing I found uh, more interesting was it's very, very small data, but there is a lot of unattended data. So the intention was first of all to generalize the baseline using an SPM to try to find the threshold and try to use the 21,000 uh, articles from Reuters to compute the IDF scores. Uh, sadly, that uh, didn't work. It produced uh, bet better recall than the baseline, but the precision hurt. And uh, I'm still very curious why this approach didn't work. I do think it should, but uh, as a result, we have to report here. And then the other thing is, by the time uh, I was uh, looking into this, I just finished writing a textbook on feature engineering, and I was curious to try things similar to feature engineering, but with the deep neural networks. So I look into transfer learning using the Thomson Reuters to compute the word to back embeddings and the, the ULM fit the universal language models with the triangular learning rates. So using the 13,000 unannotated, uh, I train a, a multitask learning system where the first task is trying to predict uh, so the, this task is trying to predict the baseline, yes. But if we were just to do that, this network would be overfit for the baseline. So we also add, try to predict whether the uh, type of um, um, trade was a buy or sell, and whether it was an equity or not. So then this network here, with an LSTM and these two dense layers, is trying to learn these three things over the 13,000 unannotated, correct? And from there, then, uh, we do the uh, transfer learning using uh, uh, stepwise towing of the layers. So we freeze the layers and we go untowing them uh, stepwise and using slated triangular learning rates. And this actually did work, it did transfer, but uh, the accuracy was still under what we were getting from space. But, uh, all in all, uh, the I mean, very exciting uh, problem and data set. The part that I do find the more interesting about the data set is that it's very unique to be able to have people telling you why they are doing a trade. Yes, in general, a commercial uh, a trader won't tell you what is the rationale. Uh, the other aspect is we have enough data here to try to do a grounded uh, semantic learning. So we can try to see, okay, people are using these words when they're experiencing particular type of traits, and that can then be used for my field that is not language generation, so you can actually describe traits from this data set. Uh, so, so to conclude, we have identified and defined this task of thought through rational identification, we have shown that the task can be annotated and automated, and in future work, we want to do a better system, for example, using BERT, and try to strengthen this language trading sophistication. Uh, thank you very much. Do you have some interface or system for your developer? Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know much about the technology institution, but I have a curious about what kind of things. Yeah, um, yeah. so I don't have a picture here, but uh, so the platform looks like this. Yeah. And um, the result of, of this work sort of is shown for the students who see um, how you know there's like sort of a grade they see from you know zero to one yeah. um, of how 
how good their their rationale is. Um, there's also an interface that shows them kind of how well they diversify the portfolio. Uh, so you know, so trading sophistication, we look at how well they diversify the portfolio. Um, you know, how many of these thoughtful rationales they they provided. Um, and the motivation is really beh behind this is not just looking at the performance, not, not just looking at how much return yeah. one makes, because that you could be lucky, or if every, if, if S&P all go up, then you're gonna go up. So we don't want to only depend on the performance, but we want to really look at the portfolio, look at these rationale. The, in, in the interface, yeah. For the student to execute the trade, they have to provide a rationale. Yeah. So th that's that's when the data is acquired. They cannot do a trade without typing something in that box. Yeah. And that's why there are sometimes very poor ones because they just don't care and mm -hmm. they just put X and then send it. Yeah. That's how the data is captured okay. in this interface. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned the Kappa scores on the uh, intermediate agreement. Could it be that there's just kind of a, some ambiguity that there's an actual ceiling on how good the system can get? Or do you think that it, it still has a lot of room to grow? It, it's really, uh, I don't know anything about finance. And uh, later on, when we went back to that, I said, well, I, this seems not important. And so, but this is a finance term. Therefore, uh, it's, it's a show sophistication because a finance person will know that this person is using the right term. Uh, I think uh, this was an example. Yeah. I, I think you didn't know what you mean by covering short, but that's a finance concept. So, so it, it was more like, can you do this with crowds or with turbots? Yes, with Amazon turbots. And what, what we come up with, well, if you do that, you're going to need a very uh, uh, robust machine learning. Otherwise, you will need uh, people with finance knowledge to do the annotation. Uh, any questions? Uh, in, in your uh, uh, four level annotations, uh, level uh, two is the majority, and uh, the remaining uh, three levels are back similar. So how do you deal with the unbalanced uh, uh, experiments? Um, so we didn't really dealt with that, I guess. Um, for 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 the space model specifically. Um, it's just basically for the legal position and recall, and we're using that as the negative one. So we are dealing by, by all the tools. So we're doing precision and recall, and uh, not thoughtful is the background class. So then uh, these numbers are much more focused on the thoughtful classification. But uh, <coughs> that type of a strong background class is very common in natural language processing tasks. If we were to just say everything is not thoughtful, I think the numbers may be even better in terms of accuracy. So I just want to confirm, I didn't read the paper in detail. You said thoughtful, not thoughtful. Uh, but how, how, how do you decide if it's thoughtful or not thoughtful? You just give me an example, do you have? Uh, it, it's decided by some expert or decided some uh, definition, I don't know. I yeah. don't know how I didn't read really, really the paper in detail. Oh, sure. So this definition were derived from the observational study. Oh, yeah, so we, had, we found these factors and then sort of realized rational tax was yeah. important. And then we went through um, the 2000 rationale and sort of come up with a definition. So according to this definition, we went back and annotated 
uh, rationale in this way. So all of these thoughts, when you look at it, it contains a specific, it, it shows the student in a specific uh, analysis, oh. versus here, it's very general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was someone uh, named Oh, of course. Sorry, I, 